those, if you're worried about bees and you're in your garden and you're gardening and you're just outside and there's a bee flying around, remember that she, now I say she because they're the ones you see are females, is she does not want to sting. Right? She's not going to attack you. They're only protective of their colony. So the only time they want to sting. So it's important to know those are the people that are scared of bees. If a bee's flying around and foraging in the garden, doing it, doing her thing, she's not going to sting. So that's that's a very very important because it's um uh, what's the word apophobia is what it's called. It's where people are scared of bees. G'day and thanks for joining me for another episode of People with a Passion. I hope you've been enjoying the episodes we've done so far. If you are here for the first time, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell to be advised when new People with a Passion interviews are uploaded. Today's guest is a beekeeper here in Australia. He's also known quite well around the world and he does a lot of TV appearances and things like that. He is an enthusiast and has been since the age of 14. And today he's going to demystify some of the myths around bees. And he's going to increase our knowledge around the importance of these fabulous insects. So if you love bees or honey, then I'd encourage you to stick around and watch this episode with Ben Moore from Ben's Bees. He also has a podcast called Bees with Ben. And he's very informative and I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. I hope you do too. So let's check it out, this episode with Ben Moore from Ben's Bees. Today's episode is brought to you by Applaudable.net. Thanks for joining us, Ben. How are you? Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me on board. I'm really, uh, really stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. Your fascination and obsession with bees has seen you in a lifelong journey. So you started this at a very young age. Do you want to tell us where that started and where you first got your very first lot of bees and beehive yes yes i was a a weird child Uh, i was an only child so i didn't have any brothers and sisters to play around with so i actually um when i was 10 years old i had this book beekeeper in the uk and i was fascinated by bees and i'd actually see them out foraging and doing their thing and then there was a wild hive not too far from my parents place and uh but what was interesting that when i was 14 i said to mum and dad i don't want a puppy or a kitten i wanted a beehive and they said, well, you want a beehive, you save up your own money. And uh, and so I saved up $60 and bought a beehive. That was 28 years ago and uh, had bees ever since. And it's been a business for me. So I'm lucky uh, since 2006. I've been keeping bees and that's been absolutely, uh, absolutely love it. So it's a borderline between uh, a passion and an obsession. Hmm. And uh, how did you go with your first beehive? Well, so the first beehive, I found a, a local beekeeper that the old man would uh, buy honey from. It was actually interesting. He'd sell the, the, these uh, big jars of honey. There'd always be dead bees in it. And I think he used to deliberately put them in there as a sign of his uh, authenticity <laughs> in regards to his honey. So I found his beekeeper, uh, Mr. Cox, and, um, yeah, saved up $60. I used to do a bit of fruit picking uh, on weekends and on school holidays. And I uh, saved up $60, which is worth, I don't know, about $550 now. And I bought my, my first beehive. And I had that beehive for a while. Uh, and about a year later, unfortunately, it died. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why. I think looking at it now, maybe it was a queen failure or something wrong with the queen. But a uh, wax moth, a particular pest, came in and, and unfortunately uh, took over the hive. But I remember um, Mr. Cox, he actually gave me my money back. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so good. That's good. That worked out well for you. Uh, yes. I noticed um, on your socials as well that you have been doing bees for some time but uh, prior to that you had an affinity for other animals and things and you had a unique job in a pet shop do you want to explain how that love around uh, animals and things you know was yes yes yeah. so i was always fascinated with the australian bush and i was that typical little aussie kid um out in the country be catching um skinks and lizards and this type of thing and so I always loved them, looking for snakes. I never find them, but I was always looking for them. Anyway, uh, I was always fascinated by their behaviour. But later on in life, I actually got a job as a pet shop, and I was there for 10 years. Now, it was not your normal pet shop with cats and dogs. It was only exotic type of animals. And I was lucky enough to breed some rare species of, of snakes and reptiles, and, and I was dealing with some institutions, zoos um, interstate. So that was a really cool experience. Yeah, and you just mentioned wax moth. That uh, what what's wax moth for people that might not be familiar with bees? That's why I've got you on is to educate us about yes. your passion. Yeah, certainly, Craig. Yes, yes, certainly. So what happens is so wax moth 
is that you know, bees get smashed by all different pests. So there's various you know, bacterial issues, fungal issues, viral issues, and pests. And one particular pest is a, a wax moth. And basically, it's like a little grub. And it's, uh, this moth comes in at night time. And uh, a weakened colony, a strong colony will keep them at bay, but a weakened colony will actually be taken over by this wax moth. Um, so unfortunately, my hive did die. But what I did learn then is, you know, where there's uh, bad, there's often good, that whole, that whole balance. So I was actually learned that if I get these wax moth grubs, the size of like a little big, like a big maggot, I was selling them to reptile keepers and for people going fishing. Hmm. And I was getting 10 cents each. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a nice little uh, profit there. If you're not profiting from the honey, you're profiting from the, wa <laughs> the wax moth. We understand the loss of vegetation is challenging for bees, but what are some of those other, you know, bio-type hazards that they're encountering that are uh, affecting their colonies? Wax moth obviously being one. You just mentioned parasites and that. So what are some of the things that, that are out there and what do they do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, question, Craig, because the biggest one, or one of the biggest issues of why bees are in decline around the world is this particular, um, it's a parasite, and it's called a varroa destructor. Now, the easiest way to think of it is like a mite, and this mite sucks the blood of the bee. It's actually, bees' blood's called hemolymph, a little bit different than mammals, and it sucks the hemolymph, and it transmits viruses and diseases. Now, Around the world, it's um, they have this mite, and Australia is the only continent not to have it, and it's a really struggle. So a lot of beekeepers overseas, I know some European keep, European beekeepers, and they'll lose on average per year about forty percent of their hives. And that's because of this particular pest, and it's absolutely devastating. But the good news is we don't have it in Australia because we've got awesome biosecurity. Okay, and are there any other things? So you got your wax moth. You've, you've got the parasite. Are there other things that are affecting the colonies? Yeah, see, another big reason why bees are in decline is because of these um, these fungal uh, fungicides, uh, herbicides, and also pesticides. So big farms, big orchards, they'll often use these these chemicals, and they'll do it at the, often at the wrong time of the day or when there's a um, the flowers are in full bloom. Bees are out foraging, and then they're just blanketed with these chemicals. So that's a, the other biggest reason why bees are in decline around the world. So our farming methods that obviously require these these insects to help propagate the growth of the plants are actually the process is actually uh, killing these important uh, insects. That, that's right, exactly. So and that's where you know the the farmers or the orchardists need the bees to pollinate. And I often need, because we're dealing with these big monocultural type crops, you know, it could be hundreds and hundreds of acres of one particular you know, type of fruit or vegetable, you know, that's, they've got to use these pesticides because they might have like particular pests and diseases that come and attack them, so, which is a shame. But it's usually the orchardists know that they need to have the bees, so they're usually really, really good as far as using those sprays. But what often happens is these sprays drift and that can affect the colonies. So are you educating those in agriculture on this or is this something that most of them are aware of? Like do governments push the, the need and the understanding around this with those those uh, growers and things like that? Yeah, so, so with the growers and so forth, they're actually really mindful of these because without the pollinators, they're not gonna get apples. Look at almonds in the next couple of months in August, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of hives get moved to like South Australia and. And, and top of um, Victoria to pollinate almonds because they're solely pollinated by bees. So they're becoming aware of the um, these chemicals and so forth. But something I've learned, it's not always necessarily the chemicals that are killing the bees, it's how they're applied is what's actually killing the bees. So so in what way? So is it like aerial spraying or is it yeah, water? Yeah, aer aerial sprays, they have these big foggers. Uh, big fogging machines and they spread the fog out of this particular uh, chemical and it's incredible to see like it's this big and you see um, the operator and the tractor uh, looking like they're um, heading off to outer space and there's full mm -hmm. you know crazy PPE with big respirators and things and you think wow that, that'd be a horrible job. Now you have a philosophy around bees you uh, and I've seen some amazing photos of you kissing a beehive so I'll put that up but you talked about a beehive that was near your home that actually was natural. 
and your approach to bees is not purely from what I understand inside the hive neither yes. that you have this approach to having them in natural environments why why that approach for you what's what do you feel what's your philosophy you have this bee philosophy do you want to explain yes you know certainly so so if we look at that that particular hive when I was young so I was uh, between 10 and 10 and 14 I was actually a, a cheeky little kid and obviously no brothers or sisters growing up in the country I'd create my own entertainment what I used to do is I would that particular hive I would throw some stones and sticks near it to create vibrations to rustle them up and I'd see how fast and how far I could run before I got stung <laughs> so I'd actually <laughs> run and go as fast as possible and I'd get stung mm-hmm. and I was, I was immune to it it used to hurt you know, yeah, these things yeah. hurt. but that goes on to say that particular strain of bees is you know they're designed to be what I call feral feral they're unmanaged so and those these particular colonies do really really well we're in now with beekeepers, and we'll see this this photo come up. That I'm kissing these these bees, like literally, no lips in there, giving them a kiss. Now that's genetics. So we can act, we think of it like dogs. We've got these feral genetics, and we've got these these really calm genetics. So uh, and that's why it's important as beekeepers we keep these calm calm genetics. But my my philosophy around bees is, you know, people keeping bees is a, it's a brilliant, rewarding hobby. You know, you know, bees do sting, but once again, we don't have these nasty bees, but what I uh, do with my bees, it's a case of I work with the bees, I don't work against them. Mm-hmm. And the much we can think, and you think of what, what the bees need, and then I work with them. And that's the most important thing when it comes to, uh, it comes to beekeeping. So what do you find that they need? Because you're treating them all like, almost in a humane, like a, there's a humanity to what you're doing. You're looking at how we live and what would make us happy. So you almost asked the question, what would make my bees happy? So what are some of the things and approaches that you, you do to keep your bees happy? Yeah, so as far as keeping the bees is they need, the, the biggest thing is they need food. Now, and that food is in the form of flowers. Mm-hmm. Well, having flowers from the forage, but they need two things from those flowers primarily is nectar, which converts into honey, and they need pollen, which is their protein, or think of it like their steak. And that's why it's important that people know that obviously this seems crazy, but a lot of people don't realize this, but bees make honey for themselves. They don't make it for us. Mm. So it's important to know that. Trust me, a lot of people think they don't make it for us. But the cool thing is when conditions are good, bees are the only animal that will produce a surplus to their needs. So that's very important. So with the honey, now if we look at honey, as far as why bees produce honey, it's a carbohydrate. And what that does is it helps keep the colony warm. So during winter time, it's winter in Melbourne at the moment, uh, could be in the other side of the world during winter. They need this honey to maintain a temperature of 34 degrees Celsius. And what they do is they disconnect their wings and they vibrate. And that produces metabolic energy, 34 degrees. That's amazing. See, I didn't know that. So thanks for educating us today. It's really good. Why, why do you respect bees so much? Because you use the word respect as well. What's this, this mutual respect you have from your experience with working with them? Yeah, so when it comes to respect, it's so important that everyone realises that one in every three mouthfuls of food that we eat has been pollinated by a bee. So roughly at, at the supermarkets, there's roughly about 100 different fruit and vegetables. 70 of those 100 fruit and vegetables have been pollinated by a bee. So that's why they're so critically important to, to humans. So that's why, you know, that's the biggest respect. The other thing is too, when they sting, it does hurt. Mm, so it's important that, that, that gains respect you're pushing and and educating people around bees but one of the things that you live so you practice what you preach is having a bee friendly garden so if someone's listening or, or, or watching this podcast what are you telling or what would you like to tell them around what sort of things they should be planting to attract bees to help the local colonies yeah, so, so when it comes to bees, the important thing is their food. Now, how do we feed bees? Because some people might you know, like the idea of having a beehive, but don't want to actually have a beehive as such because of work conditions and it depends on the area and so forth. So what we can do to look after the bees is give them their food. Now, the best foods are things like herbaceous plants. Now, when we think of uh, herbaceous plants, things like rosemary, thyme, oregano, mint. Now, we do know the bees love lavender. You know, that's like candy to them. They're attracted to that, those nectar from those flowers as well as the colour because it's that violet sort of uh, blue colour. Uh, now, bees also, too, do really well on our native uh, flora. 
So in Australia, we've got some of the best bees in the world and, and obviously the best honey because of there's over 600 different types of eucalyptus trees. And they all produce these very unique types of honey, So, which is really, really cool. Is there a plant or plants that they avoid out of interest? Is there things anything that yeah, they sure. actually don't that aren't attracted to? Well, certainly. So there is some, you know, roses, camellias, some of these types of they're not really big on them. You know, if I see a bee going there a rose, you know, as a human, we smell that rose and it's got this beautiful fragrance. But bees aren't really going for them. And it's because it's nutritionally it's not it's not that good. If we look at we know during the end of winter, the start of spring, we see those wattles. That Kudamundra wattle is bright, everything turns bright yellow, which is obviously means springs around the corner. It's rare to see bees on there, and if you do see bees on there, usually indicates that you know there's not much food within the area, and because uh, the bees are very um, find that that pollen and that nectar very astringent, mm -hmm. and that's another reason why we don't see bees really on olive trees. You know, olive trees don't need to be pollinated by bees, but like an olive. It's very, a raw olive, anyone's tasting one of those is the most horrible thing you can taste. The bees don't like them as well because that nectar, that pollen. Has so, to... so they're looking for things that have the highest return on investment as far as protein and exactly and, and things for themselves. And it's, it, I don't know what their senses are, but you made a reference to lavender and the colour of lavender. Is there, from studies, is, there, is it showing that they're gravitated to certain types of colours, that those colours are signals to them? Yes, yes, certainly, Craig. So what they're what they're uh, going for is colour, but also shape, and that's why the shapes. You look at certain things like, say, the flower of a borage. So borages, for those you know, want to plant, is that's a really great one because that yields a lot of nectar for the bees. But that particular shape of that flower and that colour, that's like a target for that bee to come in and pollinate. And remember, that also benefits the flowers as well because they need that pollination to happen. So for those that aren't fully aware of how that pollination works, what is it doing? Is it just literally going from one plant to another, bringing the pollen to the flower? Pollen and transferring That's that it. over and creating pollination or you know, fertilisation is, is what's happening. But also it's actually interesting when we look at that, let's say someone's growing, say, eggplants, tomatoes, zucchinis, capsicum, and you get those really small fruit and they're, they're quite small and, and, and don't not big and round and robust. It's actually sometimes the lack of pollinators why that happens. So the more times during a flowering period a bee can transfer the pollen, the more times that happen, the better what we call fruit set mm -hmm. that happens. So that's when you get those big tomatoes, those big capsicums. Okay. So there's a, a massive link to what we're growing in our own gardens and, um, and bees. And if we're not seeing many bees in our area, it may well be because we're not feeding them. So the, the education around that, is there anything, I'm, I'm not sure, have you produced any books or anything or any educational materials that people can access? I know you're doing a podcast called um, Bees with Ben, is it? That's right, bees with Ben. Yeah. So, so for those that are enjoying hearing about bees, then uh, Ben assures me he's got a whole heap more <laughs> information yes. around bees, a life, a lifelong passion and obsession with bees. So, if you are interested in anything around bees, then make sure you check out the podcast, which I'll put a link in the description um, below. But is there anything or any resources that you can also direct people to that I could put in a description to help them find out about that information around gar the gardens and what they could be planning? Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. So as far as there's you know, a lot of good books, there's a, um, a fantastic book. Uh, um, it's called Two, Two Million Blossoms, and that's a really good book. For those wanting to get into bees in Australia, is and even overseas, this is a really good book. It's um, Australian Beekeeping Manual by Robert Owen. That's a great book. I'm working on a book myself. It's taking some time. So in the uh, future, I'll have a book. It's not so much a how-to book, but probably more about my experiences because I love that connection between you know people as well as bees. But as far as resource, there's so many cool different areas and so forth. There's some really good Facebook pages now too. And uh, the podcast I'm doing is we're in interviewing other beekeepers from around the world, mm -hmm. so people can sort of listen. You know, say beekeeping in Norway, you know, obviously it's a lot tougher for them to keep bees as opposed to be, you know, beekeeping in say New Guinea, which would be a lot different. Mm. So we've just had a whole heap of bushfires um, in Australia. What has that 
done in those areas for the food sources for bees and you talk about the them having to move or that they've been trucking for for obviously yes. a reason beehives and bees two different areas of australia for food sources is that uh, around the fact that there's not bees in those areas or do they need yeah. more bees or what's the the like what are the two impacts of the natural disasters and the impact of let's say climate change on on how we're actually getting these crops and things propagated using their the bees yeah that's that's very interesting because what's actually happened the latest sort of statistics i think it was about two months ago have come in that in australia along the east coast so victoria new south wales over the queensland over thirty thousand beehives were destroyed in the fires now what happens is there is and, and those fires were absolutely catastrophic there's, there's positives and negatives. Now, there's a lot of negatives with this aspect because we lost a lot of bees. What's also happened is there's not going to be enough bees to, to pollinate the almonds. So that's a big uh, issue there because a lot of the beekeepers go to the almonds and pollinate. But what's also happened is it's, it's lacked the flora because all those eucalyptus won't flower for five, six years. So what's happened is we're going to have these massive voids in these particular areas. Now, I did mention positive. Now, there is one positive that's come out of this, and what's happened is through these bushfires, remember the Australian bush is designed to have fires, right? A lot of different species, particularly like banksias, they need, they need fire to happen to germinate. So we're going to see in five, six, ten years' time a, a, an increase in the amount of nectar that's going to become available. But until then, the beekeepers have to shift their bees away or... If the bees are in dire straits, need to feed them a sugar syrup to keep them uh, alive. So, who's creating the sugar syrup? There's a business in that. So, well, the reason is yeah. <laughs> like, like that's yeah. these these bees need to be fed. So, what is that? It's a good question. So, with the sugar syrup, what happens is, you know, it's it's a carbohydrate. But the problem is with sugar syrup, giving it to bees, it'll keep them alive. But there's no nutritional uh, values for the bees for them to digest and survive well on it. So they they don't do well. But by having the sugar syrup, will keep them alive. And that sugar syrup is basically um, uh, pure sucrose, uh, and that's just from cane sugar. Uh, it's white sugar, and it's usually two parts white sugar, one part water. It's dissolved, and those bees will survive on that. And that's sometimes that's important just until something could be coming in the flower and uh, just enough to keep them alive. But for those keeping bees in a suburban environment, we don't need to worry about that. And what about myths around bees? What are some of the myths around bees that you would like to clear up? Okay, that brilliant, brilliant question. For those, if you're worried about bees and you're in your garden and you're gardening and you're just outside and there's a bee flying around, remember that she, now I say she because they're the ones you see are females, is she does not want to sting. She's not going to attack you. They're only protective of their colony. So the only time they want to sting. So it's important to know those are the people that are scared of bees. If a bee's flying around and foraging in the garden, doing it, doing her thing, she's not going to sting. So that's that's a very very important because it's um uh, what's the word apophobia is what it's called. It's where people are scared of bees. So interestingly, my experience is if a bee stings you, they lose their sting, and I've heard that they die. So is it a life? Is it a death sentence if they make the decision to sting? Oh. Them? It, it, it certainly is. So what happens is, you know, if a bee stings, her venom sac and some of her contents within her, her um, abdomen actually come out. And so if she, if a bee stings, she will die. But it's only towards mammals. So with these particular hypodermal layers, if a bee stings another insect, like an intruder, like a European wasp or another species of wasp, that bee stings, she won't actually die. That's interesting didn't know that so thanks for sharing that you've been stung a few times <laughs> that's for, too many to count i'm sure what's the process of safely removing a sting if you're stung so, so if you get stung by a bee the best way is you don't pinch the uh, stinger out you scrape it out use your fingernail something like credit card something like that to scrape the stinger out because if you pinch it you're actually injecting more venom into your body so by doing that, now if you scrape it out, now the easiest way, there's two little tricks here. We do get stung because everyone has different reactions. Having something like a uh, antihistamine tablet will, will help. That's one thing. The other thing is too is um, it's going to seem a bit crazy. There's a very good tip. 
it's actually hurts that localized area is hemorrhoid cream. Okay. It's got a it's got a uh, it's, good. it's got a soothing sensation, uh, and it's like a numbing sensation, and that'll help the actual sting. So the little trick for everyone: if you do get stung by or a wasp, even uh, so, keep a, yourself a jar of uh, or, or a uh, tube of hemorrhoid cream. Yep, I will. I think I already have one that I always keep in, <laughs> in my pocket. So. <laughs> there you go not for bees obviously so uh, yeah so that, that 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 would be looking a little bit weird if you whip out a <laughs> a tube of hemorrhoid cream but and if someone says what's that for you're like oh it's in case i get stung by a bee yeah sure. <laughs> <That's exactly laughs> yeah sure so talking about myths but that one's a good one i, I like that i um i trust you on your on your advice on that that you're not just gonna make no, me look no, make no, me no, look silly no. in public when i whip out my hemorrhoid cream <laughs> <laughs> It's a good one. It's an absolutely good one. So most people do understand the importance and the significance of, of bees and what they mean for our food supply. What are the greatest threats right now to, you've mentioned the parasites and things like that. There's a lot of skeptics who don't believe in climate change, but at the same time, if climate change is real, how would that be seen to affect bees? If you know you're in, you're seeing increases in temperatures, what impacts are being projected for these colonies? Yeah, good question, Craig. So what's happening is, you know, with regards to the if, if the area uh, warms up, like you know, like we just seen uh, late last year in um, New South Wales, where we're getting these really hot, dry environments. What happens is we can have our trees flowering, but unfortunately they're not yielding any nectar, and by not yielding any nectar that is obviously no food for the bees. So we have these big, beautiful flowers, but they're dry inside because they haven't had that rain. So that's why it's important to get that rain. On the flip side to that, if we have too much rain, what can happen, too much rain, is the bees can't fly. Now, if we've seen the bee movie, um, with um, online, the bee movie, which is a great movie, even though it's a kid's movie, it's really done in an awesome way, is those, the, that rain is it's, it's uh, flying down from the sky, it actually will knock those bees out. Mm -hmm. So and they won't forage. So if it's too much rain, they can't forage for their food. So what sort of research is being done into bees? I, I saw something years ago where they studied the patterns of bees and um, you know how they fly and that they, when they find sources of food, that they actually communicate with each other via patterns. A, is that true? And, and B, what other research has been done into bees to try and understand how they're they work together to, you know, find their food and propagate plants. Yes, yeah. So, so what happens is, so bees are one of the most researched animals other than humans. So it's very fascinating because once again, we need need these bees in order for humankind to survive. But it's interesting that they do this little special dance in a hive. So if a bee she's out foraging looking for food, and she finds this area there might be a particular tree that is just in flower and it's almost like dripping with nectar she'll go back to the colony she'll do this little dance and there's different dances what they do but the most common ones is like this figure of eight right and that lets the other colonies those other foraging bees because they've got different classes some uh, like cleaners some will go up to the queen some are like wax builders honeycomb builders and so forth but the ones that are foraging she, they'll, they'll, she'll do this dance and it actually it's mathematically works out where that tree is how far it is from the axis of the sun so they've, they've worked that out and you can actually if you watch where they do you can actually work out exactly that spot where they are that's that's absolutely amazing um, that's why i asked because i read something on that years ago and it intrigued me and i was wondering if there's any further research being done on it but but that just demonstrates a degree of intelligence around what they know what they're doing even though they might not be fully versed in conversation it's certainly the basic um, transmission of some form of communication so you touched on hierarchy there a little bit so what is the hierarchy of a hive okay so the hierarchy so predominantly within a colony now the colony uh is obviously has one queen now it's the queen's not necessarily the boss you know, they work as a collective. They work all together. But they start off as um, predominantly workers, which is, you know, usually roughly about 95%, depends on the time of year, 95% of worker bees. So these are these, these females. And, and they start off when they hatch. It takes 21 days for a, uh, a worker bee to hatch. And when she hatches, she starts off as a cleaner. She's doing the janitor skills, uh, janitor work within the hive, 
does the cleaning and so forth. And she starts off, and as she gets older, she'll eventually become a forager. But there's also the queen. Now, the queen, only have one queen in a hive, and she'll live up to seven years, and she is just an egg-laying machine. She lays eggs. When times are good, conditions are good, she'll, she'll lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. Then, obviously, we need uh, that queen's got a mate. So we have these boy bees. Now, these boy bees are called drones. And it's usually in springtime, less than 5% of them are colonies drones. And they don't sting. They've got big bums. They've got these big eyes. And all they do is mate with the queen. So and if they do mate with the queen, as soon as they mate, bang, there's a click and they die. Mm. Right Now, the, these boys, bees, they can't do anything for themselves. They can't uh, feed themselves. They can't look after themselves. Uh, usually in, uh, around autumn or fall, but the, uh, the colony will kick out all the boy bees because they will only mate during spring and summer. Okay. And uh, you you hear the word worker bees and things. Are there soldiers as, like, with ants, they tend to have, like, a, a group that is there to just protect the hive? Yes, there is, yeah. And what they do is actually sit at the entrance of the hive. So they'll sit at the entrance and they're doing their checks as a, a bee comes in because that bee comes from another colony. They She smells different. She's got a different pheromone signature. So those guard bees will actually keep those other ones away. So, you know, because it will get robbers. You know, bees will often rob from another actual another hive. And you, you also uh, mentioned earlier the potential for hives to merge. How does that happen? What happens there? Yeah, so the hives can merge. So as a beekeeper, we can, uh, in a positive way, manipulate a hive. So get two smaller hives and create sort of one sort of big hive. But on the flip side of that, the bees wave reproduction is swarming. So that's when the old queen and roughly half the workers take off and they go looking for a new home. And that's how bees fundamentally reproduce. Hmm. And what, they get a bad rap when they're in a natural environment or our home environment if the bees happen to swarm and, you know, decide that they're going to set up shop under an eave or on a tree in the backyard. So what do people need to be doing if they encounter a, a beehive that's formed in nature? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, in, so it's important that if we see bees, you know, be mindful, don't go near them, uh, don't you know, throw anything at them, don't wet them with water. I don't know, sometimes people get scared and their first reaction is wet them with water, is, is call a beekeeper. The way the uh, bees reproduce is they'll take off with the uh, roughly half the workers and the old queen. And when they take off, they'll find a spot somewhere, like under an eave, compost bin, possum box or something like that. And the problem is it's important that, you know, call a beekeeper, you know, to actually remove them because they will obviously safely look after those bees and make sure they're all good. And it's important that you get a professional to do it, not sometimes people. It's important that they get really well looked after and also quarantine because, you know, they do have various pests and diseases. Do they find other hives that you've created or do they literally gravitate to nature more? Yeah, so what you can do, you can help help the, the bees by giving them lots of room. So as a beekeeper, we want to avoid them sort of um, swarming. So what we do is we actually give them lots of room because the bees want to build up. So you can do that. Or in other ways, what we do is we create these splits so you can create another colony. We can do this a positive way, but in an artificial way to actually set up another colony to prevent that from happening. So it's important. There's a, there's a code of conduct all around the world they're keeping bees, and it's important because we don't want bees being a nuisance mm -hmm. as well. Because you know, people are scared of bees, so they can sting, and um, that's why it's important that you know we do manage the hives in, in the, the, the population. And God save the queen, but how does another queen become queen of her hive? So you say one chooses to leave, is it a choice, or is there some dynamic there? Or obviously, yeah, so what, yes, yes. Yeah, so what happens is so that there's a, uh, a queen there. And that old queen takes off with half the workers. And what they do is they need to produce a new queen. So what the worker bees will do, a bunch of worker bees will go to some larvae. It's roughly, you know, so it's an egg that just hatched at about 24 hours of age. And what happens is they give those larvae extra royal jelly. And there's usually roughly about a dozen of them. And the extra rich source of royal jelly creates this bigger bee, being the queen bee. And then what happens, really fascinating process, is there's roughly about, about a dozen. And then what happens after 16 days, the first one will hatch. And what she'll do, she'll go around to all the others and kill them all. 
and then she's the, the successor. Then she'll go, uh, so there's only ever one queen, and then she'll go on to some, um, uh, get her, uh, do some practice flights, and then she'll go on a mating flight, and mm -hmm. she'll mate with as many drones as possible, and then she retains the sperm from all those drones. All those drones die. She comes back into the colony, and she lays eggs, and then until that process where she may swarm, and then, um, and then that happens again a year or two years later. That's an intriguing process from a survival of the fittest approach is when she leaves the colony, she could easily just stay there and be lazy and say, come on, fellas, <laughs> you know, come That's to right. me. But, but it's almost like, catch me if you can, strongest survive. Well, none of them survive if they get with her. But... Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, bit of, it's a bit of a downer for those that are thinking they're getting something beyond, <laughs> beyond their, their little escapade. But um, the, the truth is, is it's an intriguing process to hear how they've worked it all out. Um, and then she returns to the colony fertilised and looking to, to lay for such a long period. So it's phenomenal when you actually... It's intriguing. And I'm sure that's where your fascination, like there, it is a truly fascinating interest and passion to have, I think is, um, I, I'm, I don't have ant colonies, but I've always been fascinated with ants um, because I look at them as mimicking or, or humans. I, I, I see that we are colonies, whether people understand it or not. Our hives are our cities, our, our yes. homes, our, our streets are our, you know, pathways to these places that we all congregate. And in a way, there's, there's a lot of humanity in the hive, if I could say that, from a perspective outside looking in, that, you know, there's so much that they can teach us. Do you see that parallel as much as I've seen it, like with, say, colonies of ants or termites and things like that? Yes, and with bees, we can actually go one step further, Craig. And so what happens is bees do two things that uh, other insects don't, and it's very similar to mammals. Number one is they produce heat. So that heat, you know, I think our temperature is 36, 38 degrees, or bees are 34 degrees. No other insect produces heat on this type of level in the colony. The other thing is with bees is they produce milk. Now, when we think of milk, they don't have teats as such, they've got glands, but this milk is in the form of royal jelly. So that's very similar to what humans do. Now, it's, very, it's different, but it's when you look at it, that aspect and the way they work together and so forth, it's an absolutely fascinating, complex structure within a bee colony. If there's someone listening who happens to be 10 to 14 years old and they're looking for something a little bit different and they're in an environment where they could safely keep bees and, and present it to their parents as an option, what would you say to someone considering this as a potential passion? Oh, I'd, I'd definitely, definitely jump in and, and do it. Obviously, you've got to get mum and dad you know, or your guardian over the line in regards to uh, keeping bees. But it's research, you know, it's so much easier now than it was for me when I was 14, you know, we've, uh, obviously you've got the internet, which is great resource, but also two clubs, you know, beekeeping clubs are great and they're in all cities all around the world. You can find a beekeeping club because that way you can find a mentor. And if you have a mentor, mentor someone that can help you along the way where you've got that one person, you can ask them questions. So, and keeping bees is such rewarding. Uh, forget the honey, they obviously... They produce honey, which makes the most ideal present. You know, you give someone a jar of honey from your bees, from your backyard, I don't know if there's a gift that could be any better than that. And is, it, is there any regulations around um, keep, beekeeping in urban areas? I'm not... Yeah, so the re yes, yes, so there's regulations. Uh, so regards to regulations, it's, um, it's in, say, Victoria, in Australia, we've got a, a, a Department of Prime Ministries and we've got a certain code of conduct. And it's not, not nothing to do with councils for us. We're just going to make sure they're two metres from a fence, can't have more than two hives on a, uh, a normal size uh, suburban block. So there are some prerequisites. Uh, overseas, you know, certain um, areas are going to be slightly different. They have different ways of keeping bees, but you're allowed to keep bees in all of Australia. And in all your experience and all your life of doing this, you're doing it as a business now. Um, I've got a, it's a twofold question is, what have you seen as the biggest challenge for the industry as a from a financial standpoint? And what opportunities do you see? Yeah. So as far as it's a tough job because the biggest thing is you're dealing with Mother Nature. So I'm dealing with the elements. Now I don't have, you know, hardly any work because obviously it's wintertime at, at the present. So there's not much happening. 
come spring, it's really busy and moving bees and looking after them and harvesting honey in the spring, summertime. So it's a tough job. So it's a labor of love. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, as far as challenges, I think it's important within Australia, we maintain this varroa mite, this, this varroa destructor. We make sure we don't come to Australia because that will devastate all our bee colonies you know, here. So it's important that, but also too, when we're buying honey, support your local beekeeper and find out you know your local beekeeper there's a honey map online and you can find out where your beekeeper is and support them because the problem is we do have issues in australia as well as overseas where some honey is important from various countries and it's not ethically produced and or it's full of sugar syrup and not genuine honey so you say not ethically produced so what does that link and tie to what is not ethical in the production of these honeys? Is that what you yes. mean by they're, they're tainted with other products? Yeah, so they're, they can be tainted with other products like, you know, high fructose corn syrups and other, you know, uh, types of sugars that aren't natural uh, for the bees, but also to the way it's harvested. You know, harvesting honey is a, uh, it's a very, uh, it can be a, a non-invasive process you know, give the bees smoke, they get some calm, and we take out our frames. Often some beekeepers, you know, uh, various countries, what they'll do is they'll take the frames, they've got the baby bees, all the brood in there, and they'll take that small amount of honey and don't worry about the brood, and a lot of bees can get squashed in the process. So that can happen as well. Is there anything you want to add around what our discussion today on bees that we haven't covered? Oh, good question. Um, probably the supporting beekeepers, supporting honey, Flowers, clubs, doing bees. No, I think that's pretty nailed it. That's, yeah, um, cool. that's good. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to comment. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be advised of new interviews when they're uploaded. I hope you join us again sometime. Catch you later.